How many feel like you have a calling of God on your life? So I want you to picture it today as if it's a phone call <laughs> and that he's calling you up and that you're going to answer the call. And it doesn't mean it's going to be easy to answer the call because if you know it's from God, you still want to be biblical, right? He said count the cost before you enter into something. Don't just be foolish about it, but, but know how to hear the voice of the Lord. Know how to distinguish that from the voice of the devil. And then there's a third voice. Anybody want to chime in on that one? Yeah, uh, the, our flesh, that old nature that doesn't want to fast when we call a church fast. I mean, that's partly the devil, but it's also our, our nature. We just, we could become like couch potatoes sometimes spiritually. You know, we'll do it tomorrow. We'll do it tomorrow. But there's nothing easy about serving God, but there's a lot meaningful about serving the Lord. And you have to decide what you want to be. If you have children that are in school and they want to win uh, a starting position on the football team, are you going to tell them it's easy? Well, should you tell them not to do it then? No, it's something worth striving for, striving in a good way, right? It's what you aspire to. If I'm going to play on the team, Paul said if you're going to run the race, run it to win. So, yes, it can get unhealthy. We teach on performance orientation. We know there's a downside to it. But if you're going to do something, do it with a spirit of excellence, we work on our jobs for the Lord. Our company is secondary. We're first there as an employee of his, right? So I just want to look at some of these verses like, boy, talk about answering a difficult call, a dangerous yes. Might as well start right with Jesus, the founder uh, and the one that we worship, the, the God-man, the, the visible image of an invisible God. That's what it says in Colossians. It says he's talking to his disciples that are in the garden. He says, pray for yourselves that you won't sink into temptation. Jesus knows he's near the end now. And he had said to Peter in another place, the enemy's going to come for you. He wants to sift you out, but I have prayed for you. And when you return, right? So he's saying to them, I'm about to just separate a little bit and go pray over there. But pray for yourselves that you don't sink into temptation. And he distanced himself from them about a stone's throw and knelt there praying. Jesus said, Father, if you're willing, take this cup away from me. Yet, not my will, your will be done. You want a dangerous yes to when God asks you to do something? There it is right there. We sang it, like I said, it's a very convicting song, that last one that we sang, because we're saying, I want to burn for you, and I want you to purify my heart. Well, that means there's a detox, and if you ever tried to detox anything, you know it doesn't like to leave, does it? Anybody ever try quitting drinking coffee? The headaches that you get, like, as that stuff is purging out, and... You know, just have one more. It's no big deal. Never mind tobacco or any of the other things. Like, they're so addictive. Try sugar. Try quitting sugar sometime and watch how hard that is. And I won't go there. We're going to talk about different demons today than that one. But <laughs> God finds us in a place, and it's usually not the optimum place, right, because there's always further we can grow in being more like Christ. Would you agree that we could start with that premise that no matter how far you've gone in Christ, you could still be more like him in some way? Because Paul said it, that's a good example. He said, I have not yet arrived. I know that he called me and I answered the call, but I'm still pressing towards the mark for the prize of that high calling that he has on me. And that's how I want to live my life every day. There's something else I could do to be more like him. Now, he's perfection, right? But well, what else are you going to aim at? Don't aim low, aim high, aim for Christ. And this is just such a beautiful picture that I've, I've always remembered when I heard it preached by a man named Mark Hanby. Some of you that have been with us a long time remember him. And he just painted pictures with words that were very that imprinted on me. And he used this verse from Deuteronomy 32, verse 10, talking about God found Israel in a desert land and in the howling waste of the wilderness. And I've used this verse many times because that's what it was like doing drugs, was being like in the waste howling wilderness. This is the ESV, the King James says, the waste howling wilderness. Boy, did that paint the picture of what it's like to work for the devil. Every paycheck from the devil bounces. He's the worst boss. He's the best liar and the worst boss. So God finds us someplace in some kind of waste howling wilderness, which is just sin, 
Right? Whatever that sin is, it, imp it impacts each of us differently. But he found them there, and he encircled them, and he cared for them, and he kept him as the apple of his eye. Do you know that you're the apple of God's eye? That we don't just throw this verse out because it's in the Old Testament, but that you are his favorite. And isn't it cool that every one of us can say, I am God's favorite, and not be in any contradiction at all? Love it. His ways are way above our ways. But this is a good part right here. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest. And he, he would go into a very detailed story about this that I won't do today. But I don't know how well you could see that picture. But you could see the mama bald eagle up on here on the top right. And, and that's the kid that just got kicked out of the nest over there. And the kid is giving mom a dirty look right now. Like, I thought you loved me. <laughs> but, but what the scripture is saying as the eagle stirs up its nest, it starts flapping its wings. And the way he described it, all the feathers and the down that was in there, like the mattress, is gone. And all that's left is these big pointy sticks that are sticking up. So God will make it too uncomfortable for us to stay too long in the nest. And then he picks up the phone and calls and said, are you ready for your assignment? It's going to be a dangerous yes, but it's going to be a more dangerous no. <laughs> Whew. Let that one sink in for a minute because I don't want to be disobedient either. Oh, this is good. The mom flutters over its young, spreading out its wings and catching them and bearing them on its pinions. The Lord alone guided him. So that's a picture where mom doesn't just bail on the child, but when the, when the child's trying to learn how to fly, the eaglet is coming out and it's flapping its wings. When they're too young, the mother will come up underneath it and catch it and bring it back up again and then turn over again. <laughs> and the thing's just flapping its wings on the way down and mom comes up and catches it again. Can you relate? When God asks you to do something and you're not too comfortable about it? I remember early when I was singing with the guitar and trying to sing and play at the same time, literally, my knees were knocking. But I was behind a, a, a covering where nobody could see it. My mouth got real dry. I couldn't talk. I couldn't speak. All this cotton started coming up in my mouth. Because that's what happens when your body, when you're nervous. But how are you going to grow if you don't push through those places? And he wants us all to grow. So Every time God makes that phone call, there's a little bit of this picture of the mother flapping the wings and saying, look, I'm not going to have you living with me when you're 44 years old in the basement. You've got to stand on your own two feet. You have to individuate and become who God made you to be. And, you know, that's another day's topic because, Mom, you've got to let them go too. <laughs> Here's a phone call. God to Abraham. The Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from a family from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Big call right there. You're going to be the father of many nations. Really? My wife is 90? Like whatever she was at the time. And it says in Hebrews, all those years later, by faith, Abraham did what? That's what makes God happy. Obey. I can't perfectly follow the law, but I could sure try. I could sure just press in and know what's a sin. And what's not a sin? What does he bless? He blesses obedience. He can't bless sin. He doesn't want to bless it, but we have to know the difference. I love this because I've said it so many times since we started the church. I have it memorized. Hebrews 11, 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out, right? He picked up the phone. God said, I want you to go. He said, okay, out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance. And here's what we should all say together. And he went out not knowing where he was going. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like a contradiction? Well, well, fire up the GPS. Put the address in. The address is God's will for my life, and he's not telling me where yet because he wants me to take the first step. Well, that's dangerous. Yes. It's a dangerous yes. That's the whole point. Try, try the dangerous no. You don't want to live there. You don't want to be in rebellion. That's Jonah. You want to end up looking at the inside of a well? Go ahead. Run the other way when he tells you to go to Nineveh. But God found a way to get him back there, didn't he? By the subway train. <laughs> Spit him right out on the beach. You might not believe Noah, but Jesus quoted Noah, so you figure that one out. How about Moses? We did this last week. He got a really difficult phone call from God. He's out in the desert, and all of a sudden he stops by the burning bush. Like, this is different. Don't see that very often. There's a fire, but the bush isn't being consumed. So he got, 
interested and he walks over and the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters for I know their sorrows and the reason I'm calling you, Moses, is I'm sending you back to Pharaoh that you might bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Aren't we glad he said yes? Was it dangerous? What's the big deal about dangerous if God is on your side? <laughs> He figured that out. Wasn't easy. Boy, that guy had a rough time with those people. And then in Hebrews, it talks about a great cloud of witnesses, which we won't go into right now. But as I thought about all the people in the Old Testament, they all had to take a stand and say that dangerous yes. And the ones who didn't, like Saul, didn't end well. The ones who didn't, like Samson, all the gifting in the world didn't end well. So we have to aim high. And, and trust God that even though we don't have all the answers yet, he will show us. If we pause and we pray and we stay on our knees and keep, I know what you showed me, Lord, but I don't have the release yet. That's okay. But I, I can't stay in my mother's basement until I'm 60 years old. I hope I'm not offending anybody who's in their mother's basement at 60. There could be a good reason to stay in there if you're taking care of her, okay? I'm, I'm making a general statement here got to qualify everything these days, right? This was a really good call because this was a dramatic call that God made to Isaiah. It says in the, in the verses right before this, I was caught up into heaven and I was in the throne room of heaven in Isaiah chapter 6. And he hears these flaming creatures singing, holy, holy, holy is the eternal, the commander of the heavenly armies. The earth is filled with his glorious presence. And they were so loud that the door frame shook. So if you ever wonder why our music is loud, there's your verse, Isaiah 6, 4. <laughs> and the holy house kept filling with smoke. Smoke comes from fire. Fire comes from our hearts. The more contagious we are with that fire burning, the more smoke's going to rise. And that's incense. And the incense is pleasing to God. Our worship comes up to him like incense. I want to burn for you. Get the verse? We were singing it. I want to burn for you. And, and the purer the incense is, the less sin that's in the container, the, the sweeter the smell is to the Lord. And Paul even said it that way, a, a fragrance of life that we can be, just walking in a room to people. And then Isaiah says, I am in so much trouble, I am ruined. <laughs> That's the same thing Peter felt when he was in the boat and he just said, Lord, get away from me, I'm a sinful man. This is the initial reaction to holiness and angels. Every time an angel appears, the first thing they say is, don't be afraid. Why? Because <laughs> they're scary looking. And you probably think it's the grim reaper coming to take you away for all the hidden sins. No. God loves you. He wants you to live in that supernatural atmosphere all the time and expect it. But this is a normal initial reaction that people have. I must be in so much trouble. Here I am. I'm not holy. And all these people around me, all these things, these creatures are, are holy. I never heard anything like this. I'm just a human being, fallible and stammering. My lips are encrusted with filth. And I live among people just like me. But here I am. And I've seen the ver with my very own eyes none other than the king, the eternal commander of the heavenly armies. Then one of the flaming creatures, we know our angels, flew to me holding a red-hot ember, which it had taken from God's table, the temple altar, and a pair of tongs, and the creature held it to my lips. Get the picture? Get the picture of why we want to live holy lives? Not because we're living up to a legalistic standard. It's because as we sanctify ourselves, as we purify ourselves, we rid ourselves of the, of the habits that might not be open, terrible things that we're doing, but they're keeping us away from God. That's when the fire comes and touches and says, you can do better than this. You don't have to spend eight hours a day watching Netflix reruns and, and binge watching stuff. Spend some more time in the Word. Spend some more time praying. Go out with other people and start witnessing. Find other believers that are on fire and let them be contagious on you. And then you be contagious on them. And then this angel looks at him, called the flaming creature in the voice. Look, with the touch of this burning ember on your lips, your guilt is turned away. And your faults and your wrongdoings are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord's voice, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Sounds like a phone call to me. 
Lisa, you available? Busy right now? Got a minute to talk? I have an assignment. I'm God, so I heard myself say, give Lisa an assignment. <laughs> That's a word from the Lord. <laughs> it's going to be up to you, Lisa. She's in the back now because she's backsliding. She just wants to be back there. <laughs> He's picking on me. What do you think? Here's, here's the conditions. I know I told you count the cost. What do you think? Here I am. Send me. That's a good answer to the phone call from God, isn't it? Easy? No. Meaningful? Yes. That's how I want to live. I want to try to make a difference for the kingdom while I'm here. And then Paul, you know, you could read his story. In Acts chapter 9 is where we actually see the event when he was on the road to Damascus. And he's just retelling the story to King Agrippa because he's technically he's on trial. And he has to defend himself from the charges because he wants to go to Rome. God told him to go to Rome. But there's a lot of steps along the way. And he retells his story a couple of times. And this is in near the end of the book of Acts. There's only 28 chapters. Here we are in 26. And he's talking to King Agrippa. And he says, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Anybody here before you were saved mock Christians? Yeah, me too. My mom was the one that was witnessing to me. And, you know, I just didn't want to hear what she had to say. I called her a Jesus freak. Little did I know I would be leading the Jesus freak someday, right? <laughs> Funny how that works. God had given her a word through her brother, who was also who was a pastor. He said, when you think of your son, picture him with his hands lifted up, worshiping the Lord. And at the time, I was a bouncer in a bar on the Fort Lauderdale Strip. And you wouldn't want to go to that bar, I promise you that. So, I mean, that's about as far from where I was as what he was telling her to pray for me. And again, you know, ironic, that the music that I was learning in the world turned into worship music for the Lord. You know, God could do anything. He's turned around God. Even when you don't see it, he's working. Even when you don't feel it, he's working. He's the way maker. Yeah. Woo! It's the reason that song is so popular. We pray it. Even when I don't see it yet, I'm witnessing. I'm believing God that they're going to have a turnaround. They're going to meet somebody that's going to shake them up in a good way and point them in the right direction. Mm. So I th thought I had to do a lot of things to tear down the church. Verse 10, this I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. I'm a murderer. Trying to snuff out this new movement that was against the Bible. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. Being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. And while thus occupied, on my way to the foreign city called Damascus, with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, the phone rang. <laughs> I didn't recognize the ring either. And it didn't go into voicemail. It popped out, and everybody knew something was going on. Like, they all saw the light. They didn't all hear the voice, right? Hmm. Along that road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me, and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, which means they all saw it, right? I heard a voice speaking to me. Hello, Paul? Can you hear me? <laughs> Can you hear me now? How's the signal? <laughs> pretty bright, pretty loud and clear. And it was saying right in my Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. It's hard for you to fight what I want you to do. You're out killing Christians. Clearly, God had tried to speak to Paul, still Saul at this point, and he had been blocking that out. He was there when Stephen was martyred. And I have a feeling when he says, I have this thorn in my flesh, you could debate that another day. We'll talk about, was that a physical sickness or could it have just been the memories of all the things that he did in this stage of his life prior that, you know, you could say that would be the devil reminding him. It would be if it's condemnation. But if it's not condemnation and it's just the conviction of the Lord saying, that's not me anymore. I'm a new person. I'm going to go the complete other way. And now I'm going to advance God's kingdom. And I think Paul did a pretty good job of that. I don't know about you, but... I'd give him a good grade. 
He's definitely an inspiration to me as a marketplace guy. He was a tent maker. Didn't have to be. Pretty good, right? He wanted to still be with the lost and not float up into some church bubble and only ever be around Christians all the time because you can lose a little bit of your edge. All you folks that are out in the workforce, you know, it's a pretty cold, cruel world out there. They need the Lord. So I said, well, I know it's hard to kick against the pricks, but who were you? you? Your name didn't come up on the caller ID. Who are you? He said, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. We don't like that one. We want all of the, the revelation now, and then I'll put a spreadsheet together, and I'll size it up, and I'll do my risk analysis. I'm leaking a little bit here. Spreadsheets are us. <laughs> Thankfully, Trisha helped me get delivered from that one. <laughs> and from the things I will yet reveal to you. I'm revealing some of it now, but not all of it. You just keep being obedient and doing what I tell you to do, and you'll get the rest of it. And I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. Whoa, you're sending me to the Gentiles? I have this high rank as a Jewish official. Those people are unclean. Well, you're going to change your mind about that, Paul. Well, when your name is Paul, you're still Saul here. <laughs> to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light. Anybody? That was you? You're not Jewish and your eyes got opened up. We got grafted in to this amazing root of Abraham's seed, of Jesus, everything that, that they had as the chosen people. We are now in that root. We got grafted in. The wild root got grafted in. Thank you, Lord. And thank you that this man was obedient and he answered the call. He gave a dangerous yes, and that's all he's telling Agrippa. It's like, hey, you know, what would you have done? You hear a voice from heaven, you get knocked down on the road, you're blinded, and you could just hear him, and he's telling me this is going to be my assignment. I'm going to go to all those unbelievers that never even heard about it because we never tried to talk to them because they were unclean. And now you're asking me to go to the most reviling people we know. Yep, dangerous yes. And from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So it's not works anymore. Now it's going to be by faith. That was a hard paradigm shift, wasn't it? And we could be just as legalistic today and think people have to earn favor with God. And, you know, that's another whole day we could talk about. But right here, this man answered yes. And often we know there's a prompting of the Lord, and one of the powers of being in a body like this with people that are serious about serving God, I'm not comparing us to any other Christians but or, or churches, I just know that we've got people here that take this really seriously, and that if you need advice, open it up. Say, this is what I think the Lord is saying to me. What do you think? Would you pray about this with me? And we do that all the time. That's one of the best things that we could do for people is help you learn from what we've learned. We don't have all the answers, but collectively we have a lot more than we would on our own, right? We need each other. So this is back in Acts chapter 9. And that King Agrippa was the one that said, wow, you would almost make me be converted to be a Christian, wouldn't you, Paul? So he clearly was on board, right? He was clearly on board. And, and Paul said, yeah, I would like you to be a Christian and be just like me other than these chains. He didn't mind being a prisoner even, right? Like, it's like, nope. I'm, not, I'm on board with, the, I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. I'm not ringing the bell. I'm on an assignment. I don't care. I know I'm going to Rome. Might, might not end well. But I have a better future in store of what's going to happen. So this says in Acts chapter 9, because there's another man who had to say a dangerous yes, if you know the story. Saul rose from the ground after, being, you know, falling down. Although, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a man, a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord rings him up. Hello? Uh, your name didn't come up by the caller ID. Who is this? The Lord said to him in a vision, Oh, look at that. It's not even the call yet. <laughs> the Lord had said to him in a vision prior, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said, Rise up, go to the street called Straight, and a house of Judas, look up a man named 
a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he's praying. Don't you love that? Don't you love that? This is like seeing into the king's bedroom when, when the king's the enemy, like the prophet was able to do. And like, who, who's the cheat here? Who's snitching me out? Nobody. It's that prophet, man. He, could, he hears what you're saying in your bedroom. And God is now dropping this picture into Ananias' heart saying, there's a man named Paul, and I showed him. Lance Well now says, he places our name in the future. He already said to Ananias that this was going to happen. He already said to Saul that this was going to happen before it happened. But without our yes, it's going to be somebody else going to get that blessing. So you get the point that hearing the voice of the Lord is the most important thing. Because the voice of another, we will not follow. That's going to lead us down the wrong path. Narrow is the road that leads to life. Wide is the road of destruction. And many that go down that. But narrow is the road that says yes to the right things and prospers because they're obedient to the Lord. He's praying. He's seen in a vision a man named Ananias has come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. And here's where we could all just relate. And whenever you see the word but, you know, there's going to be a little hesitation. <laughs> and I said to say, uh, yeah, sure, you got the right number. Like, wait a minute, God. Like, where'd you get this phone number from? Because there's other Ananiases around here. I've heard about this guy. And much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he's a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of the earth. The same word that God had given to Saul, he's now saying to Ananias in this vision, in this dream, he's got an assignment from me, and I want you to be part of that assignment. Wow. Really? Cool. Up get my life insurance in order, and I'll get my will in order just in case I'm not hearing. <laughs> don't, you don't have to do that. <laughs> Try to keep you engaged here, right? All right, so he's going to be used, for I will show him how much fame he's going to have. I will show Paul that 2,000 years later in Basking Ridge, New Jersey, they're still going to be talking about him. He'll be popular. He'll have his own TV show. I want to show him all the cool things that are going to happen to him. <laughs> oh, different translation. I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. What, who answers that job description? I see a better future. I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. If I'm on the football team, I don't want to sit on the bench. I want to play. I'm going to run to win. And if there's some dis... If there's some inconvenience along the way, well, where do we get this picture that it's supposed to be convenient to be a Christian? And, you know, it sounds like tickling my ears to tell me something that might just be a little couple of shades off of, hey, no, this is, it's not easy, but it's worth it. It's so worth it to do it God's way. You're going to get so much more results. You're never going to want to go back to the counterfeit when you get plugged into the real thing. I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, laying his hands on um, Brother Saul. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you're Saul thinking, oh, wow, God spoke to somebody else and told me that I was praying and showed me that he would be here. That builds my faith. That builds my confidence. You come to church and somebody walks up to you and says, I don't really know you too well, but I was praying and the Lord put you on my heart. That's a word of wisdom. That's a word of knowledge. It's a prophetic word. And it doesn't just have to be one of the elders, you know. It could be somebody in the church who got a word for you. Then you have to decide whether you want to listen. And you can come up and say, hey, that person over there, they gave me this word. Should I trust them? Yeah, you can trust them. Yeah, they're a Christian. They know how to hear from God. And it's not like you have to be doing this five times a day for the rest of your life. The Lord will prompt you. And then when you're obedient and you say it, you're going to get it perfectly right every time. No, but who does? And how about developing our gift in him? Amen? I'm, I'm winded down. Immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. And then he rose and was baptized and taking food. He was strengthened. And now he writes about this to Timothy this and other things about his prior 
how he lived before he, he accepted Christ, before the road to Damascus. He said, I was slandering the things of God and persecuting and attacking his people, and yet he was still merciful to me because I acted in ignorance apart from faith. And when I read this, I remembered a, a very specific scene in my life before I was saved. I was on, uh, on my way to upstate New York with some friends of ours. We were going to be at a friend's house up there. And, and I was saying, man, I'm really worried about my mom. She has turned into a Jesus freak. And these two other guys are, you know, they're druggies like I was. And they're like, yeah, man, what a shame. They're getting duped by all these television preachers. And they're giving their money over. And it's all a big sham. And I'm going, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do about that. <laughs> Drop the mic. Busted. Yeah, I mean, I was just back in the car. I remembered where I was sitting. I remembered who I was with. And, you know, John Wimber had a similar thing happen. I'm a fool for Christ. Whose fool are you? Right? I was a fool for the world. Now I'm a fool for Christ. Great trade, by the way. Great trade. All day long. Best thing you can do. And then there's, there's another good kind of but here. Even though I was slandering things of God, persecuting, but I acted in ignorance, but he poured his grace over me, and I was flooded in an abundance of grace and faith and love that can only be found one place, only be found in that same place that Isaiah was transported. And he's like, oh, man, I'm in trouble. Right? I fell down like a dead man. No, no, here's, here's an ember from the fire. You're going to clean your lips, and then you're going to say, here I am. No matter what a waste I was, I'm not a waste anymore. I've got a mission for my life. I'm not going to destroy people anymore. I'm going to try to save them and show them the redemption that God showed me. I'm going to show them. And we'll get comments sometimes on our, on our social media. And people are like, well, what should I say? And, you know, an easy thing is just give them your testimony. You don't have to get into all the, I mean, it's good to get into Bible scripture and all that too, but don't try to memorize the script. Just tell them what God did for you. They don't know that story, and, and give God the glory because that's the only way it could happen. Verse 15, here's a statement worthy of trust. Jesus, the anointed, the liberating king. Don't you love that name? The liberating king. This is the voice version. The liberating king. He came into the world to save sinners. And I, right here, me, Paul, used to be Saul. I'm the worst of all those sinners. So if he can use me, he can use anybody. But it's for this reason I was given mercy. By displaying his perfect patience in me, the very worst of all sinners, Jesus the anointed could show that patience to all who would believe in him and gain eternal life. Now, you can think of Kanye West. Let's just, I'm going to throw him out there. I don't know if it's legit, if he really got saved or not. The, you know, Bob Dylan definitely got saved, but he backslid after. He wrote an amazing album, Bob Dylan did. And, and it, was, it was amazing music. So this, I don't doubt that he was really saved. It's not my job to judge him, but it, it seems like he backslid. Kanye West was really like preaching for, for the Lord. And you're going to doubt that? Like, why would I doubt it? And one of the things he said to somebody, like, how do you know this is real? How do you know you're just not getting duped? He said, well, look, here's how I'd like to tell you. Like, when you're sleeping, do you know you're sleeping? And then when you wake up, do you know you're awake and you're not sleeping anymore? Well, I know I'm not sleeping anymore because I'm serving Jesus, and I'm awake now, and I don't want to go back to that, sl that slumber anymore. So for that window, man, he got some revelation, didn't he? Come back, Kanye. I don't know where you are, but come back. That, the world can't question that. There's, you know, there, he had no reason to fall for some scam. That's what Paul is saying, see? The reason that God shows us mercy is because people are going to look at you and say, what happened to you, Tricia? You're a different person. God happened to me. Well, if he could do it for you, and Peter, not just Tricia, that's how her mom got saved. May the king, eternal, immortal, and invisible, the one and only God, now be honored and glorified forever and ever. Amen. See, that's what Paul is trying to let us know. Wherever your station is in life, here's the deal. Tonight, you're going to be a day older than you were yesterday. Right? you you got to use your time well. You only get this window that we have. So what are you going to do when he calls? Let it ring through to the, to the answer machine? Or are you going to pick it up? 
Now, you might have to say no. It doesn't mean that, you know, you're just some robot. But there's going to be times that he's going to ask you, and, and you're not sure. Just pray into it. You know, and not like the guy that meets you in the parking lot, single women, and says, the Lord spoke to me and said, you're going to be my wife. Right? Like, uh, he didn't speak to me. Might have spoke to you, but that's not the Lord I serve. So, yeah, can it get sketchy? Sure, but you're, you're with people that love you. That, that are Look, here's the deal. It could almost be a little selfish on our part because the better you're doing, the better we're all doing. The more alert you are in the spirit, the better all of us are off because the Lord will drop something in your heart like Ananias and, and you'll have a word for somebody. But if you're being you know, held down and held back, then we all suffer for that. If one is hurting, we're all hurting. If one is flourishing, that helps us all, right? You can stand. Thank you. I could have stood before you said I could stand. <laughs> so this is just one more time that Paul has given us insight post-Damascus, after the road to Damascus. He says, unjust people who don't care about God will not be joining him in his kingdom. Paul was that guy, right? He thought he cared about God, but God would have to say, I never knew you. You were my enemy. It's like people that use and abuse each other or use and abuse sex or use and abuse the earth and everything in it. They don't qualify as citizens of God's kingdom. Sounds a little harsh. A number of you know from experience what I'm talking about. Not so long ago, you were on that list. Anybody else besides me? Right? And, and in New King James it says, such were some of you. Yeah, you know, that's right, Paul. God was not on my mind. I was avoiding him. There's this another great that since then, you've been cleaned up. <laughs> and given a fresh start by Jesus, our master and our Messiah. And, and yes, we have the word of God. And yes, we have the father to embrace us. But then he also just mentions, and by our God present in us, the spirit Okay, so the Spirit of God is given to us as a gift. You might wonder sometimes when it says that John the Baptist, as great as he was, that anyone in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. That's a little confusing, isn't it? What do we have that he didn't have? You got baptized in the Holy Spirit. You've got an extra weapon that he didn't have. But are we using it? Like, that's really the question. Like, to what degree, Lord, am I yielding to your voice that's already inside of me? Everything I have is already inside of me. Amen? So look at somebody and say, answer the call. I'm still waiting for one guy in the back row there. So you didn't say it. Answer the call. Tell your sister. <laughs> Busted. I will answer the call. What do you think? Here I am, Lord, send me. What about you, Dan? Here I am, send me. <laughs> Do I have all the answers? No. But I know that it's going to be better than what I would have done on my own. Because I have a father who never leaves me or forsakes me. He loves me. He knows the plans he has for me. And that is to flourish, not to flounder to flourish in you. So, Lord, you see our hands raised today. Each one of us has a different assignment, but we all have the same aspiration to be more like you every day that we serve you, that we'll be more like you. Give us the courage it takes to make those hard decisions, to say the dangerous yes. We don't want to be those that were duped into thinking that there's a watered-down version of this. It's not easy, but it's worth it. It's not easy to serve you, but it's so worth it because a life is so much better and there's so much good fruit that will remain. And I just speak that over your people here in this house today, that there will be fruit and fruit that will remain in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen.